thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, local investing today. And I know it's not customary in this environment to have anything paper-wise. But we did provide paper handouts just because we're going to be using a lot of words that do not easily roll off the tongue. Things like crowd vesting, crowdfunding, intrastate exemption, unaccredited investors, accredited investors. So these just can be kind of messy. And so we just thought, all right, well, let's just have a handout. You have it. You can look it up. We'll also put it on SlideShare along with the slides, and we'll tweet it out later. So, um, so anyway, so thank you. Um, uh, hatch, uh, HatchOregon.com uh, is at the bottom, so that's easy. Um, and then our contact information is coming up on the next slide. So the other thing is there must be some sort of weird barrier here in the room, as neither of my um, clickers work. So I'm going to be chained here to the computer for a little bit. But uh, thanks for coming. I'm Kristen Wolf, and I'm, um, I'm, I wear a lot of different hats, as you can see. But I'm here on behalf of, um, of Hatch Oregon today, um, where I'm a board member. And we've been working on um, crowdfunding. We're going to talk all about that, so I'm not going to go into any more. Um, and Simon Love is the HAP op Hatch Operations Manager. If you haven't been to Hatch, it's on Northeast Sandy, 2420 Northeast Sandy. It's a co-working and social innovation space. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, so here's just the background. Um, it, it might seem strange. Well, there's two things that might seem strange. First of all, what are we talking about local investing at an open source conference for? Um, that question was easily answered for me by the last session. I don't know if any of you were in Kelsey's session, but it was a very good answer to the question. <laughs> um, and Audrey uh, previously um, gave a really nice session. And one of the things that she said um, quite pointedly was that we really ought to think about building better businesses, businesses that share power. Um, so that stuck out for me. And then during Kelsey's session, the last session, she talked an awful lot about the lack of transparency of technology dollars in relation to politics um, and talked about some of the ramifications of that in California and increasingly in Oregon. So these are, um, you know, we, we all probably feel differently somewhere on the political spectrum about these things. But um, what we haven't had at our disposal in, in this state until January 22nd of this year was a real alternative. And so we're going to talk about local investing as a real alternative. Why is Hatch talking about this? Um, we were a nonprofit. We've been in, a, in the business of social enterprise for about 10 years now, um, teaching and helping social entrepreneurs launch ventures. Some of those were for profit. Some of them were nonprofit. Um, we did sort of a program review a couple of years ago. And we said, all right, what's our impact? What are we doing? How are we doing? And we discovered that um, there were three things that had constantly come up amongst the folks that were, um, that were our members and were, t and were taking our programs. And one of them was um, there was no real, the, the ecosystem was just weak. There was no real place for social entrepreneurs to congregate. You know, these are people starting purpose-centered enterprises, some of them for profit, profit, some of them non. But there was no real place to run into each other. So often we would have, you know, 14 environmental projects that were quite similar. And people were so far down the road before they ran into each other that it became hard to collaborate. So we thought, OK, we, we need a place. And uh, part of that place will be the social aspect. And part of it will be helping the business support community in Oregon understand how to work with these, these enterprises. Um, this became much more relevant last year when um, Oregon became, I think, the 15th state or 16th state to, um, uh, to embrace the idea of a purpose-centered enterprise, so a public benefit corporation. Um, now the vast majority of states do, but Oregon uh, went into effect just last year. So all of a sudden, there was a, a new interest on the part of accountants, attorneys, um, you know, the whole sort of business support universe, and we needed a place to bring them together. So that's Hatch Lab. Um, the second piece is the purpose wheel. And as I, as I noted, we've done um, training programs for social entrepreneurs for a number of years now. We've now sort of codified that. And this is not, not quite public yet, but, but getting close. We're working on a sort of formal version of what you might think of as a um, kind of an accelerator or an incubator for purpose-minded enterprises, purpose-centered enterprises. And so that's coming. It'll be an online learning platform and social network. And then the third piece is the capital piece. We had social entrepreneurs constantly coming to us and say, saying, where's the money? What, how do I support this? The choices became much more complex once this public benefit corporation entered the arena because it just wasn't really clear. You had, you know, even amongst the, the funder community, whether that was angels or donors or foundations or, you know, it just was complicated. What but where is the money for a purpose-centered enterprise? Well, how do you even structure it? So that became complicated. And so we went down the road, like, um, like many states, trying to figure out, well, where is the money? How do you fund these sorts of things? And that's how we got into the local investing world, which was ripe for reinvestment. 
I don't know what happened in your lives in 2008, but I hope it's better than what happened to most people, which was um, some version of their retirement account accounts collapsed. Many students dropped out of school because they were absorbing student loans they were no longer sure they could pay for. Lots of people got laid off. There was something called the, ho the housing crisis and the foreclosure crisis. You know, name it anything you want. Like I said, I hope your lives were better. But um, on the whole, it was a pretty tragic year for an awful lot of people. And now here we are some seven years later. Uh, Wall Street has recovered nicely. However, um, the rest of the country, um, despite what you don't really hear a lot about in the media, um, is suffering from what Robert Putnam calls scissor graphs. I don't know whether any of you heard him when he was in town a couple of weeks ago, but I thought it was just a really apt metaphor. So uh, on almost any dimension you look at, scissor graphs. Picture this graph. This is a scissor graph. And on almost any dimension you look at, income, wealth, health, well-being, whatever it is, those who are doing really well continue to do really well. And those who are not doing so well are doing worse than ever. So the, these are the trends. It's not this. It's this, the scissor graph. So these trends were already at play before 2008. But it became, first of all, a lot more people fell into the negative categories in 2008. And the effects of what had been building for many years became much more evident. Um, and as an example of that, uh, men in this country have not received a raise in real time since 1979. That has continued despite the recession. We're still at real income levels for men that we were in 1979. We are also at a point where the uh, minimum wage is at the lowest value it's ever had relative to, um, to the cost of things in the economy. So 2008, pretty crummy. And so what happened is we discovered we had a trust problem, or the trust problem that already existed emerged in sort of its full specter. Um, and so until recently, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, have another slide that just came out yesterday, but oh, shoot, you can't see the words on this. OK, I'm going to read you the bottom of the words, because they're really funny. Um, so it says, uh, i got to make this bigger. Oh, OK, I'll just, I don't remember. But anyway, it says uh, something like, OK, we have to get our arms around these, um, the efforts of these people who seek to make, make transparent the lousy food we're selling them, basically. So it's Kraft and Heinz and whatever not actually solving the problem in the food system, but rather preventing momentum and, and activity on the part of those who seek to fix it. Right. So this is sort of what we saw. And it's kind of emblematic. And that might explain this 9% number, which was the number of people who trusted large corporations in America last year in 2014. So um, this year got a little bit better. This just in yesterday. These are Gallup's new numbers. So you know, confidence in banks in particular recovering. But oh, shoot, there's this footnote again. The screen's not quite big enough. Yeah, can you push it up just a little bit? So there's a footnote here that is not in the headlines. And it turns out that, yeah, uh, so. Yeah, no, it's just moving it. So it turns out that 26%, yeah, 26% have very little confidence or none at all. So again, we have the scissor graph, even in the degree to which we trust or don't major institutions. So, um, but on the flip side, here's the good news. Uh, we've always had high levels of trust in small business and just uh, things closer to us, our neighbors, that sort of thing. Those numbers have been really good, and so they continue to be good. Here's um, trust in small business. And you can see the only category that has a higher level of trust is the US military. So um, you know, uh, not, a, not a bad number, the vast majority of people. Um, if, I were, uh, if I were less polite, I might make a joke down here about how the font size 6 would not even fit in the boxes of the trust, and, uh, trust scores for uh, our US Congress. But I won't. OK. so. Um, so what happened as a result? Um, well, a lot of things happened. I mean, first of all, there's technology platforms that, as you know, have been evolving for decades and decades that now allow us to collaborate and communicate and, and sort of do stuff at scale, right? So all of a sudden, trends that had already been there took advantage of these technologies. And, um, and one of them is this notion of uh, localism. You have to have been in a cave for the last decade not to have heard sort of all the localism stuff, right? Um, live the 100-mile food diet, um, the reinvention of food systems. The other day, I was on a plane. And instead of having this shirt, the guy on the plane had an Oklahoma uh, shirt, which prompted me to actually look at where he got that shirt. And it turns out there's an Etsy shop that does nothing but sell local pride shirts. And so there's the Oregon version. So there is this sort of thing about localism in the air. And uh, there's also this sort of 
resurgence of this notion of purpose. Um, and so I don't know whether you had a chance to see Aaron Hurst when he came into town last summer, but he wrote a book about this called The Purpose Economy. And again, it's one of these things that is often attributed to the millennials, right, who grew up in a generation where you know employment uh, opportunities were not so great, and they saw their parents get hurt during their recession and all that stuff. And so, you know, maybe working a job that I like and a job that contributes to society is better than a job that um, offers a huge paycheck and is detrimental. So you often see that attributed to millennials. But um, but his supposition is that actually it's a trend that has long existed but not been articulated in a corporate context. And now because we have sort of demographically, we have baby boomers who sort of you know grew up in this quite hierarchical um, environment where you're not supposed to bring purpose to work. And then we have um, Gen X, that'd be me, down here at 37 million compared to the 88 million. And now, thank God, we finally have millennials. Woohoo! 88 million people, yes, entering the workforce, declaring that purpose matters at work. Wahoo. OK. Uh, and then makers, same same thing, right? Uh, we, there are maker space. You can't throw a rock and not hit some sort of maker space, sometimes coder spaces, hackathons, whatever. But this notion of we, we have the tools at our disposal to solve some of our critical problems, this then relates back to Hatch, where, um, where our mission is helping citizens, all citizens, not elite citizens, not award winners, not competition winners, not heroes, but all citizens um, start social enterprises that, that improve communities. And then finally. The sharing economy, which again, you know, um, you may have different feelings about sort of how much of it is sharing and how much of it is commerce, but the fact of the matter is we now are able to, on a variety of platforms, um, sort of declare our preference for access over ownership. And so it is shifting the way the economy works and it's shifting the roles in which people play in the economy as consumers, as providers, as workers, all of that. And our, our institutions don't really have a way of doing that, dealing with it quite yet, but certainly the sharing economy is one of those trends. And these are sort of acting like memes that are kind of floating around in the air and provide a context for um, this, which is the emergence of the crowd. So what can we now do together that we were not able to do before? And uh, you know, one answer to that is, um, is sort of the crowdfunding model that Kickstarter uses and Indiegogo and any number of other, um, of other platforms. The key thing here is that in Kickstarter vernacular, and uh, I don't know if anyone has a coolest cooler, but, but the, the $13.3 million cooler, <laughs> right, right, exactly. But um, you know, in Kickstarter vernacular, those who supported the manufacture of the coolest cooler are backers, right? That backer relationship differs for different people, right? If you're a backer who didn't buy the cooler, you maybe bought a sticker or a t-shirt or whatever, you're sort of a champion, right? You're part of the tribe, you have a t-shirt, whatever it was, you sort of, so you are effectively, um, you are effectively donating in exchange for a trinket or you know, some sort of recognition of that donation. That's the relationship, right? Other people may have just given, just donated, no prize necessary. There's a box at the bottom where you say, no prize necessary, right? They might have clicked that box, and then there's no, there's no reciprocal transaction. It is simply a donation. And then there are people who wanted to be the first to own the coolest cooler prototypes. And those people were effectively pre-order purchasers, right? So that's the relationship, and that is not the relationship that we are talking about once we move to the investment version of crowdfunding. So now, um, as of January 26th of this year, Oregon became the 14th state where crowdvesting, or securities crowdfunding to be specific, to be sort of technical about it, um, is now legal. Um, and here's the sort of interesting backstory on this. Um, this has actually been legal for quite a long time. Many people will attribute this dynamic, the emergence of crowdvesting, to the Jobs Act of 2012. Because the Jobs Act of 2012 declared that this might be a possibility and gave the SEC responsibility for creating rules around it. Well, suddenly there were an army of the lobbyists you just heard about in Kelsey's talk um, at play, along with everybody else. And it became a big mess, and the feds just couldn't get their act together. So two years after their deadline, we still have no crowdfunding rules. So uh, well, that's not quite true, but close. So states, in the meantime, through all of this mess, states started looking at, well, how do we move this independently of Congress, in, independently of the feds? And so um, discovered uh, um, what's called the intrastate exemption in the Securities Act of 1933 that allowed states to set up exchanges, allowed states to 
um, allow their citizens to invest in companies that were um, located in those states. So it, it falls underneath federal regulation. It's a state regulated industry. So uh, a couple states pursued that option. More states found out about it, and boom. Two years later, uh, Oregon was 14. And as of May, there's now 20. And there's now another 11 states where it's in the legislature. So we're looking at nearly every state in the next you know, year, two years, whatever it takes, um, allowing this sort of, allowing this activity, allowing regular people, you, me, not accredited investors, but unaccredited investors. By the way, to be an accredited investor, you just have to be rich. You don't actually have to have any skills or, or ability to do really anything. You just have to be rich. Um, and so that was what is preventing the vast majority of people from actually investing in local companies. And uh, that's our theory anyway. And so, uh, so now we are able to do that. So that's the, that's the context. Um, and in terms of what Hatch does specifically, uh, we're paying attention to the law and its evolution. So um, we, uh, and Simon will talk a lot about this, but we have a platform and we've been, um, we've been helping companies um, develop the capacity to do this, developing their off offering documents and so forth. But as a part of that, we've been tracking what are things that work are working well, what is working less well, what are some of the lessons we're learning. So we have a whole list of things we'd love to talk to the state regulators about changing, but they're a little gun shy just yet. We'll just wait a little while longer. Um, but we're paying attention to the law and its evolution here and in Oregon, or here and, and nationally. Um, the second thing is the HatchOregon.com platform. Um, is a platform that allows investing. And now might be the time to ask you to pull out your phones because Simon is going to walk you through the process of becoming um, registered as an investor. You don't have to invest today, but you might as well be registered so that you can. So um, there's that. And then um, we also have the Investor Ready Accelerator, which is the program that I referred to earlier. Um, we actually launched this in advance of the law so that on the first day it was legal to um, to offer, to, to offer investment opportunities to unaccredited investors in the state. We had nine companies doing so. Um, and so we helped them develop their offering documents and whatnot. I might have mentioned that we also wrote the law. I don't know if I mentioned that. But anyway, it was a year-long effort. We also wrote the law. Um, and then um, uh, investor meetups. This turns out to be really, really important because, of course, you know, eventually firms that are seeking to raise money will find all of the sources of money. Right? They'll look and they'll find them. So, but. The thing that's really tough about the investor side is that for most people, most people don't think of themselves in, in the 1%. Good reason for that. They're not. right? And so most people don't sort of think of themselves as investors. They might think of themselves as investors when thinking about their retirement accounts, maybe, or you know, some CDs at the bank, or whatever. But in terms of everyday investing, most people sort of say, like, oh, when I'm rich, I'm going to invest. right? So most people don't know they couldn't invest in local business because they're unaccredited. And so that's the heavy lift around, um, around this whole notion, is sort of getting people on board to the idea that um, they can now invest and, and they couldn't before. And investing is a real way to support local business with whom you have some sort of value affinity or just want to see in your neighborhood. So that's a big one. And then finally, data stories and lessons. Again, this is sort of you know, what's happening, what's happening here and in Oregon. I, the other thing I um, should have mentioned was that the state law varies tremendously. So for example, our neighbor just to the north in Washington, um, their, their, um, their maximum ask is $2 million, million whereas in Oregon it's 250000 So the markets they're attracting are vastly different across the states. So that's a really interesting thing to kind of watch over time to see you know, what industries move in what states, and you know, how, does, how does how these laws are structured impact that. So that's what I mean by data and stories and, and lessons. So that's the activity. And, um, and then finally, I just want to, um, you know, the fundamental reason that we're doing this is because it's uh, the idea of investing in the kind of businesses you actually want in your community is awesome. That's why we're doing this fundamentally. Um, and if you, you know, you know this. If you think about your family or friends coming into town, do you take them to Walmart? Of course you don't, right? You take them to your local restaurants, the food court, wherever you take them, the food carts, wherever you take them, it is to see something and to have an experience that is unique to here. Those are the kinds of businesses that we're talking about. Are they technology businesses? Yes, some of them. Will they scale? Yeah, we hope so. Um, but when they start out, they are typically small businesses that are at the bottom of the sort of capital, capital spectrum. Um, and they're the ones that have the hardest um, time accessing capital which, of course, is widely available, available to people who don't need it, but not so available to people who do. So uh, and then I just put a couple of quotes up there from Audrey and, um, and Kelsey that I was just like, oh my gosh, we should just have all done the same panel. So 
Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Simon, and he's going to tell you how this all works in Oregon. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Cool. Let's see if this works. Hopefully that is working. So thank you, Kristen. Uh, yeah, uh, so my name's Simon Love. I um, manage the Hatch co-working space and a bunch of the programs by day. Um, and I'm kind of quite heavily involved in this community public offering local investing thing as well. So first slide, congratulations. You are a potential investor. Um, and I think Kristen has already said it, but I will reiterate it. This is a really big deal. Um, the whole distinction between an accredited investor, who is someone who makes more than $200,000 a year or has more than a million dollars in their bank account, they don't, they don't get accredited. No one fills out a form. They don't do anything. They're just rich. So the SEC says, you know what you're doing. Do whatever you want. Make as much money off your money as you want to. For us unaccredited investors, until this came along in Oregon, there was no way a local business could solicit investment opportunities unless you're a close friend or family. What that results in is the accredited investors, the wealthy, they say, we can do whatever we want with our money. We can put it in this. We can make it 100% return. We're looking for 10x. We're angels. And for the rest of you, you can pre-order. You can pre-order on Kickstarter, or you can get a 0%. You know, you can, if you're lucky, you'll get just the money you put in back. And that's cool that you're involved in your little things. But us accredited investors, we get to really make the decisions. This changes it. Um, now anyone in, who lives in Oregon can use this, and they can expect a return on their money. So just to run through a few of the kind of technical details, I suppose. Um, so investors using this Oregon intrastate exemption need to be natural persons. You can't be a company, which is a good thing. Um, you also can't be a small consortium or family trust, which may or may not be a good thing, and we might, that might end up changing. But right now, you need to be a person. There's no age restriction. Could be children. You can buy shares for your children. Uh, you need to be an Oregon resident. The due diligence is on you. Uh, in the age of Google, you need to be Googling the companies that you think you might be putting money into and uh, check that they're real, because it's not guaranteed by anyone. And the maximum investment in any one company is $2,500. So um, to some people, it's like, wow, I would never, this is a, that's way too much. And some people are like, well, that's not worth bothering with. So <laughs> you need to f figure out where you fit in that, uh, in that level. So if you're an entrepreneur wanting to raise money, um, you need to be an Oregon-based company. Um, you do need to be a company, an LLC, or a corporation. Uh, and you get to choose all of the terms of the deal. Um, I'll come back to that. So the maximum raise is $250,000. Um, again, to some companies, that is absolutely all they'll ever need. And to some companies, that is wouldn't even buy them their 1,000-barrel brewery. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and the company must be based in Oregon. Um, and that and really function in Oregon. It can't be a shell company or a subsidiary or anything like that. It really needs to be an Oregon company. Um, and so what I say when you can choose the terms as an entrepreneur, this is this. There is no form. So we get asked this all the time. We have companies coming in and they're like, I want to sell some shares in my uh, company. Where's the kind of form where I can fill in the blanks? This many shares, this many dollars, this is how much I'm raising, done. We don't want them to do that. And the reason we don't want them to do that is because this is all new, and this is exciting, and you can be creative. Um, to give you an example, one of the companies using it right now is a farmhouse brewery. Um, they grow their own hops. They grow their own malt. They brew their beer on site. And if you buy a share in this company, um, you own part of that company, and you get paid a dividend in bar credit. So if you go and visit their brewery once a year, you can go and collect your dividend <laughs> in beer. Um, 
So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not just the investment side where you're getting money back, but you've got this relationship happening. You can have something where you get products from the company as well as really have an investment stake in that company and stand to make something from their success. So that's kind of building the relationship with that company. So coming back to those levels, the $250,000 that a company can raise or the $2,500 that an individual can invest in that company, at that level, angels just don't care. Angels do not want to be restricted to $2,500. That's just pocket money. They just do not care. Venture capitalists, even less so. And banks are like, well, I don't know. These, you know, these are not the kind of businesses we want to, you know, go through. We want we have to get all the credit reports and do all this kind of thing. Um, for a lot of companies, banks are not an option for startups. And for a lot of other companies, banks are a bad option just because it's not the way they want to do things. Um, so our thoughts on this is that it's fine with us. That's fine with us. The the reason angels and VCs invest in companies is not for community engagement. It's not for local pride. It's not to create interesting companies. It's not any of these things. They are investing to make a return. Um, and sure, there might be venture capital firms that focus on social enterprise or good things, or but it's just kind of it's an exclusive kind of club. This is something where the people of Oregon can actually get involved and actually do something with their money to bring money back into Oregon. And we often bring this figure up. Uh, if Oregonians invested 1% of their savings into Oregon small businesses, that would be nearly a billion dollars moved from Wall Street to Main Street, Oregon, without any government stimulus, without any tax raise, without any you know benevolent mega corporation coming in. Uh, it would just be a really sensible and exciting thing to do. Sensible and exciting, that's it kind of it. It would be the biggest stimulus package the state's ever seen. It would exceed the value of our own. Yep. So, and then I put this slide in, you know, it kind of might seem like we're a strange fit for open source bridge, but I don't think so at all. Um, all of the themes, the quotes that Kristen put up, all of the themes that are going on at this conference, I mean, you are the type of people who are interested in doing things better than they have been done. Stopping kind of things being locked up um, without uh, people having access to them. Stopping pools of money just getting bigger and bigger. Um, so that's what we want to see as well. We Hatch, we're a nonprofit. We started HatchOregon.com, the platform that allows this investing, just to facilitate this. We're not making any money on it at all. Um, we probably should be. That might be a terrible mistake. But um, <laughs> but we wanted to start something that was transparent, you know, that has information for people who wouldn't consider themselves investors. They just consider themselves engaged citizens. Um, and we want to actually facilitate this investing. And I mean, I will plug it. That, that So the lowest investment um, that you can make on the site right now is $100. I'm hoping that there will be some smaller companies come out with smaller investments um, in the near future. But it's a really interesting feeling. If you would like to see what that feels like, go and do it. Um, you can call the people you're investing in. You can shake their hand. You can see their business. It's not like putting it into a fund and hoping that it's not used for weapons. It's real tangible things. How am I doing on time? We're OK, yeah? I'm just going to do a quick comparison of, of where this kind of fits in the crowdfunding investing landscape and then make it real with a story that involves ice cream. Um, so comparing Hatch Oregon, our platform, with a couple of kind of other options. So Kickstarter you're all probably well familiar with. And then there's kind of a whole gamut of these kind of um, sites. Circle Up and AngelList are a couple of good examples. These are sites for accredited investors, so the, the 1%, you know, um, to put their money into startups and small companies. Um, so these guys, for-profit, Kickstarter is very much a for-profit company as well. Ours is run by a non-profit. Maybe that doesn't matter to you, but it's good information to know. 
Kickstarter is not investing. Um, they don't have to worry about the SEC for anything. Um, they're really getting donations for something in return, and that may kind of look like pre-ordering uh, is what it ends up being. Um, but it's not in real investing, which is put money in and expect a monetary return on that money. Um, and then another feature of Hatchorg, um, not our platform per se, but uh, the rule, the law in Oregon, is that it has to be small businesses. Uh, that law is 50 employees or fewer. That might be, to you and to me, be quite a big business. But um, that's the defini de definition of small business. Um, this one is how much it costs to use. These ones is the fine print. You probably can't read that, and that's kind of the idea. Um, you know, they say, in here it does say, our fees are generally consistent with other forms of, you know, um, who knows. Um, our platform is just a $50 a month platform listing fee for the companies that are on there. Um, and then credit card fees, we can't avoid. No one can avoid. Um, and Kickstarter is the 5% plus credit card fees. That's quite an interesting one because really a lot of people go the Kickstarter way. They think, wow, it's no upfront cost. That's great. And it is great. But 5% um, plus another 3%, you know, 8% ends up being a pretty high cost of capital in the end. That really has to be taken into account. Um, and the last one is that kind of we're in this, uh, the middle of the Venn diagram. It's real investing, but it's anyone. It's anyone that lives in Oregon. And I, I don't know if there's anyone here that does not live in Oregon. Um, sorry, this is not for you, but there is probably one in your state or your country. <laughs> is, is, is there any kind of talk with Washington about making kind of bilateral agreements? That... Well, the, uh, the way that this is done through that intrastate uh, exemption just means that's yeah. completely off the table. Um, I guess what might happen, and we're kind of actually all hoping will happen, will be a really user-friendly, low-cost uh, federal crowdfunding law. But that was what the Jobs Act was supposed to do, and we're holding our breath and have been for four years. And you know, you saw the map before. Everyone has just kind of given up. And it might, might become law pretty soon, but um, even if it does, I think it will take a different form. And I still think there is appeal in only sticking to your state. Some people only want local investors. Um, some people don't, and that's fine. So there will be some options, at least. So to make it real, I'll give you an example of one of the companies that has done this. So this is Stuart. Um, he and his wife run Red Wagon Creamery. It's an ice cream parlor and manufacturer, I suppose, in Eugene. Um, they have a store on the main street of Eugene there. They make really, really good ice cream. Um, in his former life, he was a lawyer, actually, and his wife was a chef. So. They're live now on Hatch Oregon. Uh, if you want to go and look at their offering document, you can just do that. It's just posted right on the, on the website. Um, and so what they decided to do, they're an existing business. They already had their store. Um, they were going along fine. Um, and probably they would not have had any problem getting capital to expand from a bank. Um, probably no problem getting it from angels. But they were in the unique position where they could kind of choose. And they thought that this was such a good idea. They're like, why would I do this? Why would I get some New York equity firm or you know, Bank of America to give me this money when I could get it from my community? And then if I do really well, my whole community benefits. That money goes back to them. So they decided to give this a shot. Um, They're selling 10% of the company as equity and as shares. Um, uh, they have an annual shareholders meeting. And in the um, offering document, it says there will be ice cream. That's another uh, tempter to get people in. Um, and so far, they've raised about $75,000 out of their goal of 120000 So they're doing pretty well. Um, if you're interested, go check it out. And if you're interested in the ice cream, just go check that out too. Um, and we are also doing our best to just kind of shout this from the rooftops. We would love to see a thriving local investment um, scene in Oregon. And that might mean changing the name. I mean, in investing, the word investment thing is just loaded, right? It's, a, it's an uncomfortable word. Um, 
So who knows? But um, I think it's exciting that anyone can do this. Um, here's Stuart with his, some big fans. Um, we had an event at the Hatch Lab. Uh, when was that? Last May, month that in May. Um, where Governor Kay Brown and uh, Mayor Charlie H Hales came along and everyone um, got to hear their thoughts. They love the idea of um, you know, freeing this up and, and Oregonians being able to keep their money here in exciting ways. Um, we had a bunch of people excited about this as well. Um, uh, Tobias Reed, Representative Reed, um, the Main Street Alliance of Oregon. Amy Cortez is a uh, uh, local, she runs locavesting.com. She's a local investing expert from the East Coast. Um, Michael Scotto de Carlo um, runs Supportland. You might have heard of Supportland, which has points for shopping around local stores here. Um, and we had a huge, we had a conference, um, yeah, May 4th and 5th called ComCap. Um, and people uh, were and are really excited about this. Um, that's, that's the tangible example. I think we'll just go um, straight to questions. And here's our plug to at least go check it out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.